It was another rip-roaring session to the upside for the bulls in the United States stock market today with the S&P 500 up well over 1% yet again. We've had a lot of those days here so far in 2023. So we'll see what that means for our posture here today. We'll see which stocks really help support the market today. Most of them kind of leaned mega cap tech oriented areas, specifically the names around artificial intelligence, as there was some big news about chat GPT earlier here today. We'll also take a look at other sectors, including oil that had a nice snapback type of a rally here tonight. And then we'll look at what areas kind of sat out today's market advance, including the consumer staples. We'll also take a look at some of the other macro conditions and have a chat about some of the things that we expect out of the State of the Union address here tonight as well. And then we'll get into our trade application example, where I wanted to focus on a company that was in the news yesterday with a big buyout announcement and see if we could play it from more, more of an iron condor type of a perspective. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's February 7th, 2023. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into the description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. And remember at the bottom of those emails, we'll also let you know which stocks are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, I've got the S&P 500 heat map pulled up here in front of us and lots of green on the board. It was another buoyant day for the bulls to the upside. We can take all the good news we can get these days. Uh, some of you have been following me on uh, Twitter here after the bell tonight as I've been discussing some of the hotly awaited uh, dividend growth or lack thereof uh, announcements from a couple of dividend kings. For those of you that are not aware of that term, a dividend king is a company that has raised its dividends for 50 years in a row or more. Uh, obviously, that's a long period of time, uh, longer than I've been on this planet, to put that into perspective. Uh, and it's not easy for a company to, uh, year in and year out, after multiple groups of boards of directors over the years, all on the same page of raising dividends through thick and thin, regardless of economic conditions and recessions and bear markets and wars and inflation and all these other terrible things that could affect uh, a company's profitability. Uh, but there are a handful, a couple dozen of them uh, that, that have managed to do that. Uh, tonight, we, ha we heard from a couple of those in their earnings announcements, and a couple of them who we've been concerned about their dividend policy here more recently. Uh, and uh, there's both good news and bad news on that front. Let's start with the good news. Uh, 3M uh, was a company where a lot of people have questioned whether they would be able to raise the dividend or not. Uh, many of you know that their stock price is down quite tremendously here in the last uh, several years, uh, largely due to a number of uh, lawsuits and litigation that they're dealing with, uh, but uh, they did choose to raise their dividend yet again here only by a penny, uh, but uh, that's good enough to stay on the list, uh, and that is their 65th year in a row of dividend increases. Now for the bad news. VF Corp, which is a company that maybe not a lot of you recognize, uh, since most of you that watch this particular video are probably closer to the trader community than the long-term investing community. So VF Corp is not as popular of a name as 3M. Nonetheless, it is very well known amongst us dividend growth investors. It's an apparel company uh, behind uh, Vans and the North Face uh, and uh, Dickies and, and a few other apparel brands that are out there. And they've done a pretty good job over the years putting together a portfolio of brand names that are oftentimes at the top of shopping lists and back to school season and different things like that. 
Well, their stock has tumbled tremendously over the last year, like a lot of discretionary companies have as well, and their dividend has rocketed up to beyond 7% at last check. And most of you are aware that the higher the dividend yield goes, the greater the chance is that there will eventually have to be a dividend cut. That doesn't always work that way. Of course, we uh, saw what happened with Exxon and Chevron a couple of years ago when uh, their dividend yield skyrocketed into the high single digits as well, and yet they maintained their dividends and were growing them as well as the years went along. And of course, now their share prices have more than fully recovered and have gone on to all-time highs. So it does work both ways, and it is a reminder there are no guarantees in this business. Uh, we, we start every one of my DGI classes off with uh, a list of disclosures, and one of them I bring up every single week is that dividends are not guaranteed. Remember, uh, they are not a contractual obligation the way that uh, a corporation's bonds might be. Dividends are completely discretionary from the board of directors, and uh, we hope that they will constantly be rising in a perfect world, but we also recognize we don't live in a perfect world, and bad things come out of the blue and uh, upset the apple cart, so to speak. So tonight uh, in the after hour session, VF Corp along with their earnings did announce officially that they are cutting their dividend. Now they're not eliminating the dividend. In other words, they're not just getting rid of the dividend entirely, but they are reducing it by I think it was 41%. So uh, the 7% dividend yield that exists right now will be lopped all the way down to about 3.5%. Uh, and I know those of you that are traders uh, that are watching this video, you probably don't know, is that a normal thing or not? Uh, it really is not. I mean, obviously dividend cuts do happen quite regularly, but it traditionally happens with lesser quality businesses. Uh, businesses that are a lot more cyclical and that haven't uh, stood the test of time. Uh, it is actually quite rare for a dividend king to cut its dividend. It's only happened a couple of times in the last 10 or 12 years. 2008, 2009 was a little bit of a different time period, of course, because that was when the economy was incredibly stressed. So we might have seen a few more at that point. But since 2008 and 2009, there's only been a couple of dividend kings in that entire time period that have cut their dividends. So uh, VF Corp, unfortunately, is added to that infamous list there. So uh, that's the, the bad news side of the equation. But uh, back to the bright side, uh, because it's always more fun to talk about the good things that are happening in the market. And that is what we experienced here in the stock market today. You can see way more stocks were up than were down. And importantly, some of the biggest players were up, including Microsoft, which of course had a big announcement here today in regards to their AI uh, division and the chat GPT uh, tool in particular, uh, basically being partnered up with uh, Bing as a search engine. Remember, Microsoft actually has a $10 billion investment in chat GPT. And so that's looked as a, a competitive advantage of sorts compared to Google, who had up to this point really been the dominant search engine out there and probably will be for the foreseeable future because old habits die hard. But if uh, the public realizes that uh, Microsoft search engine is becoming better or more efficient than Google's, you just don't know what the future holds. Both of them did very well today because the focus of this current market seems to be on artificial intelligence and anything uh, associated with those uh, themes seems to be doing pretty well. In fact, as I look at Microsoft and Google with those bright uh, green patches there, and I see NVIDIA in between them, it is a reminder that in my top-down trend trading class, we own all three of those companies. Microsoft and Google, uh, we've owned for a long time. They are what is known as our coffee can stocks. In other words, we once upon a time were trend trading them and then they doubled for us while we were trend trading them. So we sold half of our shares, extracted our original cost basis out of them, and are now playing with the house's money on the rest of those shares. So those are kind of permanent fixtures within that trend trading account uh, here that we operate at Market Scholars. NVIDIA is more of a recent trade that is part of the um, kind of up and coming crop that's been popping higher here from a trend trading perspective in recent weeks and months. So we pretty we have a pretty healthy dose of uh, artificial intelligence in our uh, top down trend trading account, and many of you probably do as well because those have been some of the most popular growth stocks over recent years. They have some of the biggest market caps, and now they're off and running 
stunning once again, based upon almost a completely new theme, right? Uh, artificial intelligence wasn't really what pushed Microsoft and Google higher over the years, or NVIDIA for that matter. NVIDIA had been known as more closely aligned with gaming chips and driverless car technology, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin mining, that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, Microsoft with its office products and its cloud, and then Google with more of the advertising and YouTube. Um, you know, the AI functions of those three businesses were kind of there. Uh, it's not as if they, they just appeared out of nowhere here today. Uh, it's just that the investor focus really wasn't on that area. Now, all of a sudden, you wake up and it seems like everybody is talking about AI. Uh, and so we'll see how long that theme lasts. But for right now, there's a lot of good mojo behind some of those tech themes out there. Apple had a pretty good day as well. It was up nearly 2% here today. And of course, that helps from a market cap weighted perspective. You also saw that Tesla had another up day. It was up over 1% today. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway was up over a percent. JP Morgan was up over a percent. Merck was up over a percent. Those are some of the bigger names out there as well. Um, and then I would also point out that energy had a really strong day. Now, keep in mind, energy really has not had a great year. They've kind of struggled in comparison to the way that they were performing in 2022. So far this year, it hasn't been quite as easy for them, but today was a rare day where they snapped back furiously. So, you know, your Conicos, your Chevrons, your Exxons of the world were all up, you know, anywhere between two and 5% here today. On the flip side of the conversation, the areas that seem to struggle today were more of the defensive areas. And remember, that's an okay thing, all things considered. Again, as a dividend investor, I'm not entirely enthusiastic about that personally, uh, but in recognition of what the market desires in order to have kind of a risk on mindset, uh, I would prefer for the health of the market for the more cyclical and growth oriented areas be leading the way. When the defensive areas are leading the way, usually that spells doom for the market in general. So uh, this is kind of what you wanna see all things considered from a sector rotation perspective. You notice that Verizon and AT&T, for instance, were out of favor here today. You saw a lot of the consumer staples out of favor. Procter & Gamble was down nearly a percent. Pepsi and Coke were down a touch here today. Mondelez, Hershey's, all those stocks that did reasonably well last year are now being left in the dust this year because you know, basically they probably out earned their potential last year is what I've kind of been instructing my dividend growth investors at Market Scholars is, hey, don't get used to what we experienced last year uh, because that probably was a little bit of a fantasy land that we lived through there where dividend stocks did so well last year in comparison to everything else. And so hopefully we've been prepped accordingly. And I know I've mentioned it here in this free YouTube video a number of times already this year as well. So hopefully that does not blindside anybody, but uh, it is true that risk appetite is now high once again, and many of these old school dividend paying companies just are not uh, you know, getting the enthusiastic response from Wall Street that they were last year. You also saw some of the consumer discretionary stocks down here today. Home Depot catches my eye there with uh, being down over a percent. So all in all, pretty strong day across the board, but in particular, mega cap tech really came through in the, in the clinch there for us here today. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to our market statistics and get a sense of market breadth here. I've got the S&P 500 pulled up on the visualized sub tab of the market watch tab on Thinkorswim. And as you can see, 351 stocks of the S&P 500 managed to close in the green today. So it wasn't just a story of the mega cap tech oriented companies, although they were certainly a big part of the story. They weren't the only story, right? Some days we see that where it really is the bit mega cap tech that's carrying the whole market all by themselves. Today really wasn't that way. Um, yes, you had uh, the defensive areas sitting out the rally, but you had plenty of small and mid cap kind of cyclical companies do just fine here today. You know, things like, um, you know, materials did well. I noticed that uh, DuPont had a great day as an example. We actually concentrated on uh, the materials sector in my dividend growth investing class earlier today. So for those of you that are premium members, if you missed the class, feel free to check that out. The recording is available on our website right now. Um, so anyway, 351 companies 
did manage to close in the green today. That's good for about a 70% hit rate. So 70% of the companies in the S&P 500 closed in the green, only 30% closed in the red. For those of you that weren't aware, um, Jerome Powell, of course, Fed chairman, uh, did have a speech here today. Uh, it wasn't an interest rate announcement or decision like we had last week. Nonetheless, uh, we always like to get a sense of what he's thinking about. So uh, the financial media tends to tune in to his every word. Uh, and uh, the good news is the stock market really didn't get shaken off course based upon what he was saying. There were some people that felt that last week when he made his interest rate decision before the Friday jobs number that came in extremely hot, in other words, unemployment rates are at historical lows, that some people might have been thinking to themselves that the next time we hear from Jerome Powell, he's going to be talking really tough once again because he didn't have that information when he made the interest rate decision a few days prior. Well, we heard from him this week, and he didn't go and, and, and throw a cold, wet blanket on this market rally. Uh, you know, they kept on uh, moving higher, and uh, it didn't really seem to bother him uh, as much as you might have expected it to. So he seems to be okay with the way things are, are shaping up uh, at this moment in time. Obviously, uh, things will change, uh, and that's why we got to keep our eyes on the situation. But for right now, uh, the bulls are running wild. And, uh, you know, uh, you can have different thoughts and opinions as to what should be happening. But the truth is, we're getting market bounces and breakouts all over the place. And so uh, we have to also recognize the truth of the situation that price represents at this moment. All right, let's go ahead and now get on over here to our charts. I always like to get started with our our chart review by looking at chart 6D on days when we have an at least a 1% move in either direction. And today was another one of those 1% to the upside, the ones that we enjoy. Uh, and you can see what that kind of looks like in the middle portion of this chart, where we've got this black zero line that goes through the middle of it. And that represents a day where the markets are exactly flat. Otherwise, the green bars growing up from the black line or the red bars falling below the black line will represent how much the stock was either up or down that day. In this case, we're using the S&P 500 index in our chart here. And you can see we have another one of these green bars growing up and beyond this blue line here. And as you can see from the label, the blue line is the 1% uh, price move. On the upside, of course, that means it was a plus 1% move. On the days where the red line stretches down to the lower blue line, that's a minus 1% day for the market. And so, um, you know, I don't really have a lot of additional commentary beyond what I had mentioned to you guys last week when we looked at this, uh, which is uh, basically there's a, a, a change of you know, sentiment or feeling towards this market, it seems like uh, to me here in 2023, where our more aggressive days are stacking up more actively in the green bar session, as opposed to back here when we saw a lot more of those exaggerated days in the red bar category. So when we do have the more volatile days like we've experienced lately, it's been days where the bulls have ended up winning the day. And of course, that is a bullish feature of the market. It's basically giving you the sense that the uh, the bears are you know concerned perhaps cowering, perhaps running away. Some of them are, are digging their heels in, I have no doubt as well. But in general, uh, what we are finding is that the power uh, is being pushed by the bulls right now, right? Basically, when you're looking at price, it's a function of supply and demand. Are the bulls more aggressive or are the bears more aggressive when trading the shares of stock that are available? Uh, because for every share of stock that is bought, somebody else is selling it. So it's the same amount of shares changing hands on both sides. It's a matter of who's more aggressive in the mindset. Are the bulls more and more willing to pay higher and higher amounts for the shares like they have been here recently, or is it the opposite? So that's another feather in the cap for those who are bullish in the market right now. It does seem like demand is more than offsetting the supply of shares that are available, and that is rectifying price to the upside and helping those that were hurting quite a bit last year, right? This has been a unique year 
in that a lot of the areas that struggled the most in 2022 are the areas that are up the most so far uh, this year. Now, I don't know how far I want to see that theme taken because I've heard uh, stocks like GameStop and AMC and Bed Bath and & Beyond and some of these junkier companies, Carvana comes to mind, um, that are really roaring higher here this year. And I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing for the market at large, but it does tell us something about risk appetite and it is high right now. Uh, whatever got crushed the most last year has the greatest chance to be up the most significantly this year and vice versa. Uh, the stocks like the big blue chips that held up the best last year are the ones most likely to be either down or at least relatively underperforming this year. So sometimes we have those years where it's like a light switch upon the calendar change of the end of the year. And it feels like so far, that's what we've been dealing with here from 2022 to 2023. Notice that the VIX did fall again here today. Uh, it closed at about 19 today. So remember when we were looking at the VIX at you know 20 to 30 fairly regularly um, back here during this era. In fact, the VIX had gotten up to 35 on a number of occasions. It didn't quite get to 40, but 35 was happening. Uh, now all of a sudden we're down at 19. So it basically tells you that fear is leaving the, the station, right? Uh, it's, it's not as easily found as it was just a few months ago. Uh, the, the market participants in general have become more comfortable with where the market is currently priced and what the prospects are for a potential soft landing by the Fed moving forward and what that means for earnings and profits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the, the, the boogeymen out there, I think, is that we still are at a reasonably high valuation. So while I'm happy to see the markets uh, stabilizing here since I'm uh, more of a long-term dividend-focused investor myself, so naturally, I would prefer when markets are stabilizing and heading higher as opposed to plunging. Uh, of course, that can provide opportunities as well. But normally speaking, we'd like to see stabilization. We don't like to see roller coasters that are out there. Um, so, you know, you have to recognize that, you know, I've, I've been pleased to see the stabilization of the market. But at the same time, the thing that kind of haunts me in the back of my mind is uh, we're not at a, at a particularly cheap moment in time within the stock market. Uh, yes, price came down tremendously last year, but we came down tremendously from some of the most historically overvalued markets in history. So even though it feels like we really took some lumps last year, really all it did was corrected valuation to kind of more of a normalized value, not a cheap valuation. And that does make it feel a little bit different than some of the past skirmishes out there like 0809 or even the dot-com bubble where things got so out of hand to the downside that we actually got cheap in the market. And that is not really how I would categorize things at this present moment in time. Whether that ultimately ends up happening or not, of course, is anybody's guess. But uh, I do find that to be kind of a fascinating discussion at this moment. Of course, uh, we're going to hear from uh, the president tonight as well here in the United States with the State of the Union address. And rumor has it uh, he's going to be railing against uh, corporations and their stock buyback programs. And uh, the rumor has it that uh, they'll be uh, insisting upon uh, four times higher tax charged to corporations for doing stock buybacks um, at this moment. Um, if it goes through. But that's a big if. Of course, it's got to win the votes in Congress and everything. Uh, but uh, that could have an impact on markets uh, tomorrow as well. Remember, corporations are oftentimes the, the buyer of last resort. Um, it's kind of nice to have them in the markets in one degree because you know that they are there to support their share prices. You know, if a stock went down 90%, uh, it's not likely going to be one that had a lot of corporate buying taking place within it. It can happen, especially with junkier businesses, but quality businesses, you probably wouldn't experience that. Um, and if there were no uh, corporations buying their own shares up, you know, by millions and millions of dollars that they put to work, then it's possible that there could be more chaotic times in front of us as well, right? Think of the, the flash crash types of days that are out there when, you know, buying volume just completely dries up. If the corporations aren't in there buying their own shares and it's only retail investors and alg algorithms, uh, then there could be more chaotic days in front of us if, you know, uh, corporations take the president seriously tonight about really railing against buybacks. So uh, I'll be curious to see exactly how he phrases that and, you know, how, um, you know, the, the audience kind of receives that message. So, you know, stay tuned on that information as well. Let's go ahead and take a look here 
at our normal four grid now, see what uh, see where things stand with our postures. A reminder that this chart 4B will show us the um, four major US equity indices and will give us a sense of what the posture is for the market forecast technical indicator. For those of you that are premium members, you have access to all 50 plus of David and I's customized charts. Uh, in fact, I just got done posting a note there in Telegram to those of you that are in our private ch Telegram channel uh, that I did get the newest uh, dividend stair step charts updated and are ready to be imported by all of you. Remember that those particular charts, which are charts 2A and 2B, do need to be uh, imported into your own Thinkorswim platform once per year. Most of our other charts, that is not the case because they are basically self-adjusting types of charts based upon price and volume that's already flowing into the Thinkorswim platform. But the dividend stair step charts are very unique because it's more of a proprietary calculation that I'm doing out of the Thinkorswim platform on my own spreadsheets, and then I'm bringing those numbers back into the charts themselves. And since they're based upon a rolling 10-year number, I basically have to do calculations once per year where I'm lopping off the 10th oldest year and adding the most recent year, uh, and those numbers do change uh, as the years go along. So for those of you that attend my Monday afternoon options for long-term investors class where we sell puts on dividend stocks, or if you attend my Tuesday morning dividend growth investing class, I would encourage you to go to our website and import the newest links into your own Thinkorswim platform. Remember, you can find that on our website in the premium tools uh, tab and then the premium resources sub tab. Uh, anyway, back to this chart here for B. You can see not a lot changed since the last I was with you on Thursday where all of our charts remain strongly bullish and that should not be a huge surprise. Now, I guess there could have been some question because prior to today, we did have two days of selling in the S&P 500, but it wasn't a vicious selling, right? We basically just kind of cooled off uh, a really hot market prior to that moment in time. So as you can see here on this chart, we have been bullish for the vast majority of 2023. This little gray line that I'm kind of circling right here represents the crossover from 2022 to 2023. So you can see for the first two or three days of this year, we were still in that bearish posture with that red background color, but then we flipped to this green background color, uh, basically that third trading day of the year, which would have been uh, January 5th in this case. And with the exception of just one quick little head fake in the middle of that, we've been bullish that entire time, uh, mostly because markets have been uh, behaving themselves. And uh, I would even say more than that, uh, markets have been strong. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird to say, you know, after what a difficult year it was last year, but this has been an actually a strong time period since the beginning of 2023. It hasn't just been a meh. Uh, type of a rise, right? Just like, you know, an afterthought type of a move. This has actually been a strong move uh, where many of these candles are trading near the highs of their uh, days, giving you the impression that had the markets been open for more hours on those days, the prices probably would have gone up even higher. Uh, it was only the closing bell uh, that allowed the, the, the bears to, to kind of you know lick their wounds a little bit more. And obviously things do change, uh, but for right now, we're in one of those stronger moments in time for the stock market. And so it's not a surprise that we remain with the strongly bullish posture. Notice that the green line on all four of our charts is not just bullish, but it's in the upper reversal zone on all four of those charts. So uh, the readings on all four of them, the S&P 500's green line or intermediate line, as you can see in the label, is at 89. Uh, on the Dow Jones, it's at 82. On the NASDAQ composite, it's at 90. And uh, the Russell 2000 is just a hair above that, just fractionally at 90 as well, but 90 spot 88. So you can kind of think of the Russell and the NASDAQ as kind of tied for leadership right now from that perspective. Um, and uh, you know, for a while, that seemed like that would be highly unlikely. Right? We saw the big move out of the Russell 2000 a few weeks ago at this point, but the NASDAQ really had to play catch up in a big way, and it has come through. Uh, you can see all these bullish candles on the NASDAQ. I mean, those are not just 
you know, average days there. Those are some pretty aggressive days that we're looking at um, here this year. Many of those up one or two percent. Today we fell just shy of two percent. Uh, the Nasdaq was up one point nine percent to be exact, um, but it was still a very very good day. Um, you can see the S and P five hundred was up one point two nine percent. The Dow Jones was up 0.78%, and the Russell 2000 had a rare lag day where they were up, but just up 0.76%. Remember, the Russell 2000 had been one of our leading areas. This three-day rally that they put together last week was absolutely extraordinary. So part of the reason they might have cooled off a little bit today is because maybe they just out-earned their potential a little bit last week, and um, they're just letting some of the other indices catch up a little bit there. But um, the other thing that brings all of these together is that the Moving average, in this case, these are 30-day moving averages, are all painted green right now as well. And remember, that signifies price is above a rising 30-day moving average, which, as most of you are aware, we consider as more of a bullish feature, all else being equal than a bearish feature. So not a whole lot of complaints here, right? You had a little bit of a cool off uh, in the last couple of days, but today the bulls are reasserting themselves once again, like they've done so often so far in this quite young year of 2023. But hey, it's better than the than the, the opposite, right? This year could have easily started off, um, you know, with the bears, you know, reassuming their leadership. Uh, instead, we have the bulls doing it, and they're doing it awfully well. So um, we shall see uh, what 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 is in the in the cards moving forward. But for right now, what do we know? We know that the postures remain bullish, uh, just like they have been basically uh, since the first week of uh, January, with the one exception in the middle. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support this free presentation. Many of you are aware that these videos take David and I at least three hours of our time uh, each day that we do them, and we try to do them regularly as often as possible despite us not getting paid to do these videos. So we always have to ask ourselves, is it worth our time? Is it worth the at least three hours of our time to get this information out to you guys? And the way that you can let us know that it you consider it to be worth the time is by clicking like for us there on Twitter. As I always say, um, you know, the uh, as long as we're up and over 100 likes, I'm happy to do a full-length video, including a trade application example and more analysis on additional charts. If uh, you'd prefer a shorter video, then don't click like, because if we're under 100 likes, then the next time I'm scheduled to do the video, I would just do a 15-minute quick hitter type of a video only on the indices themselves with no trade application example. So we'll let you guys decide collectively. Do you like the longer form videos? If so, help support us by clicking like. It only takes five seconds of your time and doesn't cost you a penny. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, then just don't click like if you prefer the shorter ones there. Uh, here's some of the other information I was discussing before on my Twitter feed about some of these different dividend increases and decreases announcement as well if you want to check that out on your own time. But let's do some shout outs here to those that helped click like for us last time around. Thank you to Craig. Thank you to uh, Serene. Thank you to Tom and HR and uh, Craig uh, and Dave and Terry, Doss, Nietzsche, John, David, uh, NZ, Teddy, Robert, Renee, uh, Jimmy, Hector, BZ, Dale, Pam, Arth, Eugene, Daves, Karen, George, Brian, Ash, Sherry, G, Jayesh, and thank you to Jayesh as well. He helped me a little bit with some of the scripts there with our uh, dividend stair step charts on our uh, non-standard dividend paying labels up at the top, which is a, a very small part of the charts, nonetheless an important one to many of us. So thank you, Jayesh, for your talents as well. And then Fafe and Randy and Michelle, Carlisle, David, Claire, uh, Biz, uh, Dale, Thomas, uh, Sheila, Greg, and others. Can't get to all of you, but I, I like to kind of mix it up and uh, let you know that I, I appreciate you and I'm thinking about you and uh, keep up the good work on your end as well. All right, let's talk about the uh, sector selector. 
Remember, this gets updated on Friday evenings on our website, so it's a little bit stale right now. Remember, if you're a premium member of Market Scholars, you actually have access to the real-time data by using chart 1E. But here in this free video, uh, we just show uh, the, the, the graphic a couple of days stale for those of you that are uh, just the free viewers of the, the YouTube videos themselves. So it kind of gives a, a little bit of a perk to those of you that are premium members if you want to use the chart on Thinkorswim. But for this purposes, it generally Generally gives us a pretty good idea of what's been happening with sector rotation. I don't have a whole lot to share this week because I spent a lot of time on this with you guys a week ago talking about how the, the top three sectors were the exact top three sectors that I would want to see if we wanted to have a nice, robust, bullish market environment. Well, guess what? Here we are a week later and all three of those sectors are the exact same that are up at the top. Consumer discretionary is leading the way. Communication services in, is in number two. And information technology is in number three. Remember, those three areas are quite important to the market because of who their leadership are within those areas. Remember that Amazon and Tesla are part of the discretionary area. Uh, Meta and Alphabet are part of the communications area and Apple and Microsoft are part of the technology area. And since those six companies are so important to the overall prospects of the S&P 500, that's an area that I would prefer to see doing better as opposed to worse. If you want the markets itself to be strong, then you want the most important components within the markets to be strong. And so uh, once again, we are in a favorable position here from a sector rotation perspective where we've got more of the growth oriented areas up at the top and we have more of the defense areas like consumer staples and utilities down at the bottom. So again, that's another sign of the health of this market right now. You want to see it shaped up this way where defensive is out of favor and growth is in favor from a risk-taking perspective. Additionally, I wanted to show you real quick that most of you are aware that once per month I have a couple of uh, blog posts on dividend growth investing and these are actually available for free uh, whether you're a premium member of our website or not um, and so feel free to check those out on your own time if you're looking for them on our website go to the blog area and click on dividend growth investing so while you won't get the opportunity to join my premium dividend growth investing classes you can read some of the blogs and the materials that we'll use occasionally for those classes and so last week I did make those updates so if you're curious which companies raise their dividends in the month of January uh, feel free to check out that blog post uh, for those of you that are curious what my opinion was on these various dividend increases we had that conversation Monday afternoon in my options for long-term investors class where I told you which stocks impressed me with their dividends and which ones disappointed me from their dividends as well so feel free to check out that recording if you're a premium member from Monday's class and then early Earlier today in my dividend growth investing class, we chatted a little bit more so about this other post here uh, where we look at the sector attractiveness which is more of a valuation concept based upon um, the average high yield theory that I teach to my students on Tuesday mornings. So this is kind of the opposite of a price momentum based graphic like I was showing you a moment ago with the sector selector. This is kind of akin to which sectors have the most attractive dividend yields at this moment in time and more typically when the dividend yields are the most attractive is when their stock prices are out of favor because most of you are aware when prices go down dividend yields go up and so um, anyway uh, we do have uh, an update there as well and we talked about how this number changed um, in January compared to the prior reading from the end of December when 35% of all companies that we track on the dividend stair step charts were considered to be attractive. Now that number is all the way down to 28%. Now remember both of those numbers are down tremendously from uh, September. The end of September uh, there were about 42 or 43% of all the stocks we track that we would have considered to be um, undervalued aka attractive for our purposes for new money moving forward and of course that was when the market was in the in the throes of the worst part of its sell-off and if we could all go back in time and scoop up some additional stocks at the end of September I think that probably would be um, something that many of us would be in, interested in knowing what we know about the markets right now so remember these statistics are helpful because it helps set our expectations about when is better or not 
uh, to be buying stocks for the long term. And when the market is the most out of favor, and stock prices are down the most and dividend yields are up the most, those are oftentimes your best opportunities to buy for the long term. Uh, and that occurred last fall. Uh, it is not quite as attractive here today as what we've been looking at recently, mostly because the stock market has been rebounding. So anyway, feel free to spend some time on that uh, if you want as well. Again, those two posts are available for free on our website, regardless of whether you're a premium member or not. All right, let's get back on track now with some more think or swim analysis. And we are going to do some 12 grid analysis, starting with chart 5A. Now, as this pulls up here, a reminder that uh, the background colors of these miniature charts will tell us whether the current posture is either bullish or bearish, uh, as opposed to kind of seeing the posture shifts um, that take place throughout the time period. It just plots one color in this case because otherwise it would be too hard for the human eye to decipher anything on these miniature charts the way that we can when we only have four charts in front of us. So anyway, um, when you're looking at this here, first thing that catches my eye, at least compared to what we were dealing with when we reviewed this in Thursday's uh, presentation, is that we do have a few more pink charts that have showed up on the board all of a sudden. Um, notice that oil remains with a strongly bearish posture down below. It was actually up nicely today. Oil was up three three and a half percent today. But despite that, because we had sold off so aggressively last week, we're just basically you know getting back to the underside of that falling 30 day moving average right now, or at least, um, rising moving average, whatever it is, it's uh, it's below the moving average at this moment in time. And so um, basically today was a sharp move, but knowing that last week was also a sharp move to the opposite side basically means we're just kind of revving our wheels in the mud right now uh, when it comes to oil. Gold now has a light pink color, uh, which I find to be somewhat um, interesting. Some of you that follow the news in the gold mining industry might have known that there was a stock that we have an open trade on in this very presentation that was very much in the news on Monday. Uh, this past Monday was a rare mo uh, merger Monday, right? We used to have those quite often when liquidity is high and the Fed is dovish, but we haven't nearly had as many merger Mondays uh, when interest rates have been higher and the Fed hasn't been as um, dovish as they used to be. Uh, but this past Monday was a little bit of an exception to that, where we had a couple of big announcements, in fact, three different big merger and acquisition types of announcements. One of them occurred in the uh, self-storage space, uh, those of you that follow me on Twitter uh, would have been well aware of that because I was tweeting all about that on Sunday night. Remember, normally business news does not break on Sundays. Uh, so that was a rare uh, kind of thing that even uh, surprised and shocked me. So naturally, as a guy that pays as much attention to dividend stocks as I do, uh, when there's big news in the REIT industry or the real estate investment trust area, uh, I'm going to get that information out to my followers as soon as possible. Uh, and in that case, it was public storage that is buying out life storage. Uh, public storage is also raising their dividend by 50%. Yes, you heard that correct. Not 15, 50% in addition to attempting to buy out life storage. Now, uh, to be fair, public storage had kept their dividend at the same rate for several years prior to that. So they're kind of playing catch up to the others that normally raise their dividends once per year. Nonetheless, that was eye popping, largely because of the stature of public storage. Out of all the, um, you know, the, the, the self-storage REITs that are out there, that specific niche within the REIT area, uh, public storage is the largest of all of them. It's like a $50 billion company. So to also have a 50% dividend increase and a splashy, uh, acquisition announcement all happening on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, that was not uh, what I was expecting. So anyway, that was one of the big news stories that came to light over the, the last few days. Uh, another one I think was, I want to say it was Catalent, that was getting uh, a buyout offer by Danaher, which I'll actually be talking about a little bit later on in the video tonight. Um, and then the third one, which is uh, more tied into this conversation here about gold, is Newmont Mining uh, is buying 
or at least attempting to buy new crest mining over in australia which is also a very big mining company over there that's worth somewhere between like 15 and 20 billion dollars so it's not an afterthought type of a company it's a legitimate company one i've known about for many years myself um, a lot of american investors aren't as familiar with it because um, it doesn't really have um, optionable ADRs here in the United States. You could buy them on the pink sheets if you wanted to, um, but uh, they are a big deal over in Australia. If you if you, if you uh, went over to the Australian Stock Exchange, they would be one of the biggest mining companies over there. So anyway, uh, that was a pretty big splashy news story as well. And as often the case, the company that's making the acquisition or at least making the offer of the acquisition, their share price more typically goes down and the company that's being bought out share price typically goes up. And of course that did happen once again in this situation. The good news from our trades perspective is we're still in good shape with that trade. Remember with that Newmont mining trade that I showed you guys here a month or so ago, uh, it was a bull put spread. So it was not a trade where we needed some sort of an aggressive directional move out of it. We just wanted it to be bullish even if it kind of meandered higher and we got kind of got lucky uh, just to show you the chart here real quick on Newmont it had gone up tremendously for several of those days and remember our break even is way down here below 45 so yes it was a little bit disappointing to see it come out with that story of trying to buy out another company and see its share price go down tremendously as a result of that but we did not breach where our break even is and remember that trade does expire next week because they were the february contract so i'm still feeling reasonably good about that trade despite some new information that kind of came out of nowhere here in the last 40 Eight hours of it and if it stabilizes here and works its way back up the chart again who knows maybe we'll take another trade application on that one down the line at some point so anyway gold has not been quite as an enthusiastic area as it had been earlier in the year it had quite a big drop here about a week or so ago and while it has stabilized right around that 30-day moving average it hasn't really started going up either so on the on the one hand, at least it hasn't continued to go down. On the flip side, it hasn't gone back up either. You're basically just have gone straight sideways here the last few days. So we're kind of awaiting more information on gold. I'm still a little bit more optimistic than not, but I could easily be wrong on that as well. Remember, I was pointing out last week how gold had these overbought cluster signals. And so from that perspective, we should know that stocks and in this case, commodities don't just grow to the sky without ever giving something back. This is that give back moment right now after being too hot to the upside according to the overbought clusters. Now the question is, do we find stabilization and catch a bounce from here? I think there's a decent chance of that, but I think part of it is also, how does the stock market continue to react to you know Jerome Powell and inflation concerns and things like that? If we are in the midst of what will ultimately become one of the strongest years uh, in recent memory, and that's a possibility, you know, it sounds kind of funny to say it, but, you know, judging by how strong we've been so far this year in the stock market, that's a possibility. And if that is the case, then my guess would be gold probably won't do as well as I had expected prior to that knowledge. In other words, if the stock market is rocketing higher, gold is probably not going to be the best place to be. You're probably going to find much better opportunities in the more speculative stock area. But if the stock market rallies, does cool down a bit moving forward, then I do still think that gold can still have a pretty reasonable year. So we'll keep our eye on it. Right now, we're kind of awaiting more information in gold. By the way, it was up today, but just barely. It was up 0.09% today. The dollar was down today. It was down 0.18%. One eight percent, but because the dollar had a pretty sharp rally here over the last three or four days, we're back above the moving average for the first time in over three months on the dollar. So that is important information. Remember, prior to that, every time it had come 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 right up to that moving average, it had rejected it and, and fallen back down. So the fact that it was able to get up and over and stay over the moving average is somewhat noteworthy. And remember, if the dollar is going to go. Uh, into more of a strong time period as opposed to the last three months which have been weak, then you can make the assumption that with a strong dollar, commodities could then cool off. And likewise, you might start seeing some of these foreign stock markets cool off a little bit as well. You'll notice up here, EEM is with a light pink background color telling us that we have a weekly bearish posture there similar to gold. In this case, we're sitting right on the moving average. And similar to gold, 
I don't want to give up on the on the possibility of this kind of resetting the deck and us having an opportunity to trade this to the upside. But what would be helpful in that situation is if the US dollar could slip once again. And right now, you know, it's hard to say whether that's in the cards or not. Right now it's kind of stabilizing above the moving average. But uh, I'll be curious about that because these are kind of the charts that I like to see. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not personally very big on buying breakouts. I know other people are really into that sort of thing and some people are very successful with it. It just doesn't really fit my personality very well. So if I'm gonna ever trade an uptrending chart, my preference would be charts that look like this where we can still see a clearly defined pathway of higher highs and higher lows, but instead of buying it up here when it's giving you an overbought cluster signal and breaking out to new highs, instead wait for a pullback to a reasonable support area and then look for a bounce up and off of that support area. And I could envision that potentially happening on EEM. Uh, again, it would be helpful if the dollar could roll over in order to see that happen. Uh, and there's no guarantees that will be the case. But um, right now, at least it's, it's on my radar as a possibility moving forward. EEM, by the way, was up 0.4% today. EFA, uh, which tracks the foreign developed stocks, so think of you know Australia, Japan, Europe, as opposed to the emerging uh, world where we've got you know uh, China and India. Uh, and and by the way, hearts and and thoughts and prayers go out to all of you that might have been affected by the uh, the horrible earthquake over in Turkey as well. Turkey, of course, would be uh, an emerging nation there as well. A, a huge population. I've actually been there myself to Istanbul, uh, and a great country, uh, really a scenic place and, and lovely people and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, my heart goes out to everybody that was affected by that. The last I saw, the death toll has gone up to 7,500. Of course, that is a that is a horrible, horrible thing for um, you know the the. Uh, our, our human society, right? We don't want to see that uh, happening to anyone out there. We've had our own uh, terrible um, concerns from Mother Nature here in the United States with, you know, Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy and, you know, earthquakes and all kinds of things here as well. But uh, we have to remind ourselves there's a lot of other people in other parts of the world that are not nearly as well off. And uh, I'm afraid that Turkey is really suffering right now. So uh, I, I sure hope none of you uh, were, were directly impacted by that. But Turkey would be an example of a country that is in the emerging uh, stock market world. Anyway, with EFA, uh, you can see that we had a, a fairly decent bounce today. It was not as aggressive as the United States. So again, that kind of makes sense with the dollar um, kind of popping above that moving average. It seems like there's more hesitancy towards uh, these foreign areas now. The US market did outpace both foreign markets here today, but at least this chart on EFA looks a little bit better than EEM because the, the bounce that we've seen so far today has been more aggressive, right? You could actually get away with saying that that is a bullish engulfing candle that we see right there on EFA. And of course, you can all see that the background color is green as opposed to pink over here. So that's another sign that EFA is currently a bit stronger than EEM. High yield bonds had a decent um, kind of bullish engulfing type of a day as well. Uh, they were up 0.36% today, uh, despite having interest rates going up. Notice that the 10 year treasury yield was up and finished at 3.67% today. Typically bonds are down when interest rates are up, but remember TNX directly tracks government bonds and sometimes high yield corporate bonds do not act the same way as government bonds do. Today was one of those days where it kind of went its own direction. And many of you have heard me state in the past that there is a higher correlation between high yield junk bonds and oil than you will find with oil and other types of bonds. So I do wonder if oil's big move higher today helped the high yield junk bond market there uh, in this particular instance. So um, you know, high yield bonds remain with a strongly bullish posture there as well. Bitcoin had a decent day up over a percent. It's still trading above 23,000 and holding on to some of these higher levels that we've seen in the last couple of weeks and does continue to have a strongly bullish posture. Looking now at our sectors, and as this pulls up here, you can see that we have two pink charts on the board, at least dark pink, and that is energy, despite energy leading the way today with a 3.25% snapback rally, we still have a strongly bearish posture on it, uh, as last week was particularly bad for the energy stock. So today just made up for part of last week's losses. Staples has uh, rolled over yet again, and remember that as a defensive sector uh, is actually a good thing if it's doing poorly while the rest of 
the market is doing well, all else being equal. So staples were down 0.42% today as people didn't have any use for the Procter & Gamble's of the world and were selling those off. And you can see that's looking like a bounce down and away from a falling moving average right now. So more of a bearish feature towards the consumer staples at this moment in time. Um, and then we also have materials with a weekly bearish posture, but that one, the chart still looks pretty good. So I'm not going to really spend much time, you know, hemming and hawing about that one until we have further information. In terms of the, the charts that are a little bit more firm at this moment in time, I would point out technology looking really strong, right? Tech was up 2.5% today, and we have a new closing high on a three-month basis in the technology sector. I would also point out financials had an awfully strong day. They also closed at three-month highs here uh, today. All right, let's get into our trade application example for the evening. And today, I thought we would take a peek at Danaher. Now, technically, Danaher is a healthcare company these days. Uh, and healthcare, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner here, kind of looks like it's tracking the moving average a bit lower. But it's not been like sharp sell-offs. It's just been kind of meandering lower more than anything. Remember, Danaher used to be more of an industrial company, but they have kind of changed their stripes over the years and done a lot of reorganizations and spinoffs and things like that. So their focus these days is much more uh, within healthcare. And I'm going to pull up chart uh, 3A. Danaher's ticker symbol is DHR. And as I mentioned earlier, they were actually part of the story here earlier in the week of all the mergers and acquisitions activity as they are attempting to buy, I believe the, the company's name is Catalent. I think it's uh, CTLT. Uh, and you can see Catalent shares erupted higher here uh, recently upon that news in addition to the uh, earnings that they uh, produced. So anyway, um, Danaher, um, the main reason I'm looking at it is not necessarily because they're involved in you know any mergers or acquisitions or anything like that. It's mostly just because their stock price hasn't really done much of anything. And remember, this has been a year where most stocks have done quite well in 2023. So it's kind of saying something when this one is not. It's not that it's done tremendously poorly. Uh, it's actually up just barely on the year. Here was the last day of 2022. And today's closing price is just, you know, a few pennies, uh, you know, above it, probably not much. The close that day was 265.42. Today's close was 266. So uh, in other words, you had about 50 cents higher where we closed today than where we were at the end of last year. So in other words, this is about as flat of a chart as you could possibly find on a year to date basis. Now, those of you that are familiar with my various trades and how I kind of set them up can probably already see where I'm going with this conversation because you see two uh, blue lines on the chart, two kind of horizontal lines there, and those represent break-even points in a trade known as an iron condor. Now, when we sell an iron condor, uh, what we are doing is we are effectively hoping that a stock stays neutral. In other words, we don't want it to be highly directional in you know either up or down. We want it to basically continue to coast sideways uh, like it has previously. And so what I did in this case here today uh, is to sell the March contracts. Now, one of the bad things about Danaher is as a higher price security, it does have $10 between its strikes. So for some of you, that might not be ideal, right? Every one of you are gonna have different account sizes and we can't uh, consider all of you out there for that. So some of you, this might not work. For some of you, it might. I'll leave you to determine that for your own situation. But um, it is a $10 wide uh, iron condor where on the top side or the call spread side that I sold on the top, it's the 280 by 290 and then on the on the bottom side on the put spread side that I sold it's uh, 240 by 230 and I was able to collect two dollars and 85 cents for selling that spread which did give me a return on risk of at least 30 percent which is what I'm typically shooting for with these types of trades now one thing that does look different about this chart for those of you that have a very uh, perceptive eye out there is most of the time you guys will know that I kind of um, kind of have the strikes equidistant from wherever 
uh, the stock is currently trading when I'm doing these iron condors. But today, I chose not to do that. Part of it is there weren't there weren't as many um, strike choices available, right? Sometimes when you're trading, you know, Microsoft or Apple or Tesla or SPY, you have tons and tons of strike choices. Danaher is not that popular where you had tons of choices. So that was part of the story. But in addition to that, um, with this one having a, a, a pink background color here currently, telling us that we've got you know, a bearish near-term posture with this blue line rolling over down below, um, I wanted to account for the possibility of a move lower more aggressively than the risk of a big move higher. Um, and so in this case, you can see where we're trading right now at the end of the day is closer to my break even on the top side as opposed to how far away it is from my break even on the downside. If you had tr traded it at the, at the low of the day, it would have been about immediately in the middle of those two lines. But remember, I don't do these trade application examples at the beginning or the middle of the day. I do them in basically the last half of an hour of the trading session so that way I can notify all of you who are premium members on our Telegram trade alerts area of what the details of the trade are. So this trade was done near the end of the session here today. And therefore, you know, if I have a risk of the trade, the risk right now, just by judging by the numbers, is that this stock really rockets higher. But because we're bumping our head up against the underside of this moving average, and the fact that we had this breakdown here uh, the first week of January that broke through these prior support areas, I'm kind of wanting to set things up a little bit more where I want to account for the possibility of the stock making a sharp move lower as opposed to a sharp move higher. I could be wrong about that, but the other part of it is, you know, the stock market's been running really hard already this year, and so it does make you wonder if the whole stock market needs a little bit of a cooling off period for a while, and if that's the case, then of course the downside risk is going to be a little bit more concerning. So did things a little bit differently with this one here tonight where it's a little bit more lopsided, but I think you get the general gist of the trade. This stock has basically been stuck as flat as a board so far on a year-to-date basis, and I want that to continue to be the case between now and the middle of March. Okay, so that's what I had for you here this evening. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, I have one simple request out of you. It won't cost you a penny. All you have to do is click like for me there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes by the time I'm scheduled to do the video again on Thursday, I'll plan on doing another full-length video. On the other hand, if you prefer the more uh, abbreviated sessions of only 15 minutes where we don't do these trade application examples and what have you, then don't click like, and then we can do a much shorter version for you on Thursday if that is your preference. Okay, so I'll let you guys decide on that. Regardless of what decision you as an individual make, I appreciate all of you for checking out tonight's video, and I'll wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.